Okay, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to, to talk about contacting one another paranodal proteins in inflammatory neuropathies and in particular in, in CIDP. Uh, what is CIDP? CIDP is a chronic, is the acronym of chronic inflammatory poly, demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. Um, is uh, the most frequent uh, chronic inflammatory neuropathy, but it still is very rare. Uh, it's a disease that is chronic or multiphasic. Uh, symptoms progress along eight weeks or more. Uh, this is very important. The diagnosis is based on uh, clinical and electrophysiological criteria, and there are no biomarkers so far that could help in diagnosis. It's pretty disabling, despite it, there's uh, treatment for this disease. 50% um, of patients remain with significant disability, even with treatment, and uh, responds to immunomodulatory therapy, and in particular, uh, to plasma chains and, and intravenous in immunoglobulins and steroids. And it's very heterogeneous disease. Um, uh, there are several clinical variants. Uh, uh, the typical CIDP, is a sensory motor, a predominantly proximal disease uh, with demyelinating features in the electrophysiological studies and with high uh, protein content in the CSF. But there are a number of other clinical variants uh, ranging from uh, focal, uh, focal presentations, uh, pure motor, pure sensory or pure ataxic uh, presentations, distal variants, uh, different associated features like cranial involvement or a monoclonal gammopathy, and various presentations. It can be relapse and remitting, it can be chronic progressive, so it's pretty heterogeneous uh, in its presentation. Uh, it is uh, presumed uh, an autoimmune origin, and this is the, the type of cartoon that, that everybody presents to show the pathogenesis of this disease, in which it is supposed to uh, have a, a, the sensitization of an, a, a, against an antigen in the periphery that um, promotes a T and B cell response that uh, cross-reacts with a myelin antigen in the, in the nerve, and that drives the disease. But this is based uh, almost exclusively in, in animal models, and there is uh, there, there's not much research in, in uh, with samples or with patients. Uh, so uh, it is autoimmune because, uh, or at least it's presumed autoimmune because we know that it responds to immune modulation or immune suppression uh, because we can find inflammatory infiltrates in, in the nerves and roots and necropsies and biopsies. And also because some experimental evidence uh, uh, shows that, that uh, there is a, an autoimmune um, process in its, in, in its pathogenesis. And it, it has always been believed that uh, there is a prominent role in its pathogenesis of autoantibodies. First, because uh, this disease responds pretty well to IVIG and, and plasma exchange therapies. Second, because it has been found the position of uh, IgG or RGM in, uh, in sural nerve biopsies, because this disease associates with polymorphisms in FC uh, gamma receptors of immunoglobulins, uh, in particular with this one, with FCG R2B, and because, and most importantly, because passive transfer of serum uh, from patients leads to a neuropathy, inflammatory neuropathy, in animal models. Uh, the topic of autoantibodies in CIDP has been a hot topic in probably the only hot topic in this disease uh, for more than two decades, almost three. Uh, but the description of antigens or potential candidate antigens followed the development of animal models. Uh, uh, so uh, considering the demyelinating uh, nature of the disease, most studied antigens were myelin antigens, in particular myelin protein zero, 2, 22, and gangliosides. And, uh, None of these antigens, uh, the antigens described so far, uh, had any clinical utility uh, because uh, they were present in a significant proportion of controls too, because uh, they were uh, discovered uh, with techniques that didn't uh, take in account conformational epitopes, uh, and also because the approaches, the experimental approaches were biased, were mostly candidate antigen selection of, of the, of the antigen studied. Uh, 
Uh, since a uh, few years ago, uh, the nodes of Rambier that, that had been studied before, but, but uh, they, they are now again um, uh, coming up all, all the time, uh, nodes of Rambier have been um, Show, have been found to be uh, disrupted in the biopsies and nerve biopsies of, of these patients with inflammatory neuropathies, in, and in particular in CIDP, uh, and their structure disorganized. Uh, in particular, while well, the group of Claudia Sommer uh, very recently has shown that uh, it looks like uh, the demyelination process in these uh, in these patients, or at least in a subset of these patients, uh, starts from uh, the paranodal areas and, and um, uh, depending on the disease is different, but in CIDP it looks like it's pretty specific. Uh, uh, it starts with an elongation of the paranodal uh, gap. And um, in this paranodal area, uh, there are a lot of proteins, but not only and, and this paranodal area is pretty important for uh, axoglial junctions. Uh, so a demyelination process not necessarily has to uh, come from a, an antigen that is in the, in the myelin, in the, in the Swan cell, but also could, could come from a, an antigen uh, of the axon. So that led us to think that maybe the, the right approach was not taken so far and, and to think if maybe axonal antigens could be involved in the pathogenesis of this disease. And this led to, to this paper that, it, that is the one that was awarded yesterday. And uh, in this uh, paper, what we did uh, was to take 46 patients from our clinics with CIDP, typical or atypical CIDP, that, uh, that were followed in our clinics. And so we had clinical information available and followed an, um, an unbiased approach for antigen discovery. Uh, what we did basically was to take, in this case, primary cultures of uh, hippocamp rat hippocampal neurons, and we chose hippocampal neurons because first they had been used before for antigen discovery in other diseases, in, in autoimmune encephalitis, and they are pretty clean and pretty uh, good uh, for immunoprecipitation studies. Second, because the machinery, the molecular machinery of myelination is pretty similar both in the central and the peripheral nervous system, and we had them running in the lab, so we used this, this model. Um, if patients reacted against neurons uh, by immunocytochemistry, what we did next was to immunoprecipitate with patient sera uh, with uh, hippocampal neurons, and then uh, the precipitate we ran in a electrophoresis gel. And uh, if there were any differential bands between patients and controls, we excised the band and sent to mass spectrometry. Uh, if any protein uh, was considered relevant, then what we did was uh, to confirm the reactivity in a different model in immunocytochemistry with uh, hex cells transfected with a protein of interest, and then confirm if, if there was any reactivity against uh, relevant structures, in this case in peripheral nerve, in, in rat teased nerve, teased nerve, nerve fibers. Uh, what we found uh, was that uh, seven out of 46 patients reacted against uh, hippocampal neurons. That was just 15% uh, of, of the total cohort. And four patients uh, reacted very strongly, and those were the ones we used for immunoprecipitation experiments. So of those four patients, three of them had a very clear differential band uh, in the electrophoresis that was excised and sent uh, to mass spec. And uh, uh, three, uh, th those three patients uh, identified contacting one in the immunoprecipitation, and one of those three patients also precipitated this other protein, Casper-1, uh, and this was confirmed in this, in this third patient uh, by Western blood that the, in the precipitate both uh, proteins were, were present. So then we moved into uh, immunocytochemistry to confirm the results. We found that of those three patients, two uh, had antibodies against uh, contacting one transfected HEC, and the other uh, patient did not react when only contacting was transfected, but reacted when uh, both contacting one and Casper one were co-transfected and only in that situation. And that, that this was the patient that precipitated both contacting one and Casper one. 
So uh, from uh, the controls, we had uh, 104 negative controls uh, that were of different diseases, all of them, or many of them, uh, of autoimmune origin, and, uh, and also resemblant to, to CIDP, or at least with some features that could be uh, confused with, with CIDP. And uh, all patients and controls were negative for CASPER-1 antibodies when, they, when CASPER was tested along in, and not in combination with uh, contacting one. Also, to further confirm the specificity of the reactivity, what we did next was to pre-incubate the serum of the patients with either hex cells, untransfected hex cells, or contacting one transfected hex cells, and we, sh we, we saw that uh, uh, the reactivity was abrogated when the serum was pre-incubated with contacting one transfected hex cells. And, uh, well, here is the... the combinatory, the combination of, of images. And uh, the most important part is that these three patients shared the clinical phenotype, the, the clinical features. They all were uh, older. Uh, the, the mean age was 51 for anti-contacting one negative patients and 71 for these three. Uh, they, were, they had a motor predominance instead of sensory motor. They had an aggressive neuropathy, and in fact, two of them had been diagnosed as CVS, uh, which is a, a, a very close related uh, neuropathy. Uh, two of them, uh, well, all of them uh, were um, bed bound or wheelchair bound uh, very, very rapidly. And this is something that is rather uh, atypical for CIDP. Uh, they all had axonal damage at onset. They, they had typical uh, demyelinating features as other CIDB patients, but they also had acute denervation in the first EMG that was performed. And finally, uh, although most patients or uh, the majority of patients with CIDB respond to IVIG, these patients did not respond or respond very poorly to IVIG. So what's the relevance of, of these findings? Uh, the antibodies uh, against uh, the, com the contacting complex uh, identify a homogeneous CIDP subgroup, and then these this, uh, autoantibodies are the first biomarker in CIDP that can have diagnostic and prognostic implications. And finally, that the screening or, or the, the screening te technique with neuron immunocytochemistry and uh, identification of antigens by immunoprecipitation uh, proves as a useful uh, approach for antigen discovery in inflammatory neuropathies. So uh, we know that those antigens are, or those autoantibodies are specific, and we know that uh, they can be useful in the clinics, but we don't know if they are pathogenic. Uh, these, these studies are following, but uh, only seeing what, uh, b coming back to, to this slide, uh, this is where contacting Ka and Casper are, and this is where the demyelination starts. So we believe that, uh, although we have to confirm this, uh, these autoantibodies are pathogenic. And also, uh, if we look at the contacting one knockout mouse, uh, we see that it has slow conduction velocities. That is something that our patients have. Uh, prolonged uh, latencies, that is something that our patients have, and decreased amplitudes that also our patients have. But uh, this is not, these are the patients that were very positive for uh, neurons, for hippocampal neurons, but almost 41% of patients, 41 of patients react against other nerve structures, uh, nodal or, or uh, myelin structures, and also some patients that didn't react against hippocampal neurons had a paranodal pattern of staining so, and we also knew because uh, simultaneously to our, to our study, other studies were published in other uh, proteins uh, that uh, one of the antigens that had been described uh, at the same time as ours was neurofasting in this type of neuropathies. And uh, neurofasting has two isoforms, one that is in the node and, and clusters uh, sodium channels in the node but also uh, neurofasting has another isoform that is in the Swan cell and the, 
uh, and that binds to contacting one and Casper. And uh, what we did was to just check if some of our, if any of our patients had autoantibodies against neurofasting, and we did immunocytochemistry with both neurofasting 155 and 186 with uh, the immunocytochemistry technique, and we found two patients that were positive for anti-neurofasting 155 antibodies, none for the other isoform, and also that these patients were, in fact, the ones that reacted against the paranoid, but not against hippocampal neurons. So uh, these are the clinical features. I don't know if I can, uh, can you switch on the video, please? So this is just to show you uh, how it looks like uh, in the clinics. Well, we are gonna wait a little bit, but you can see that, well, the patient first has uh, distal weakness uh, and the tremor that you will see better now. That is, this is not the typical CDP at all. Uh, this, now you, you will see. Mm, inflammatory neuropathies can have tremor, but not, usually not that amplitude and not that uh, frequency. Uh, I, I will explain you later what we think. So this is to show that the patient had a prominent distal weakness. He cannot uh, raise or lift his, his uh, foot up, uh, while the typical CDP also is usually proximal, not distal. And the tremor, you can see that the tremor was also present in the, in the legs, although it was less prominent or less, uh, had less amplitude. And uh, let's see. And this is how the patient walked, uh, just to show you that the, the distal weakness, you, you can see that, that uh, the patient uh, doesn't uh, lift his foot at all. And this is, uh, this is an inflammatory neuropathy, but it's not the most typical CDP. So the weakness was predominantly distal, the patient had ataxia, a, very, a pretty disabling tremor of low frequency with when tested uh, with electrophysiology was three years. Uh, the, in this case, the EMG was demyelinating. It had not uh, axonal features. And again, the patients did not respond against IVIG or uh, steroids, but responded to plasma exchange. These were two patients, remember. So what we did next was to uh, ask uh, other people in the CIDP, uh, well, in the CyberNet network, uh, using the, the databases that Isabel uh, has set up, and uh, we asked for other patients that were IVIG resistant, considering that it's not so frequent that uh, patients are resistant to IVIG, we, we asked for IVIG resistant patients, and we found eight patients uh, from, coming from Valencia, from Belviche, from Santiago, from uh, Marques de Valdecilla and Santander, and uh, we found two more patients with uh, auto uh, antibodies against neurofascin 155. And this is one of the patients uh, coming from Santiago de Compostela. You can see that it's pretty similar to the other one. And um, there was another patient from uh, Santander that uh, had similar clinical features despite the absence uh, of tremor in this case but also no response to IVIG, distal involvement, et cetera. So this is, um, this is the, the patients. And then when we had the four, we confirmed the reactivity with, uh, with ELISA, and we showed that, uh, of, as expected, the patients with antibodies tested by immunocytochemistry had higher titers. Uh, in fact, all the other patients, ADP or controls, did not have any antibodies against Neurofasting, and very important in this case, uh, all patients had uh, antibodies of the, or predominantly antibodies of the IgG4 isotype, isotype. And this is important because IgG4 is a, a special immunoglobulin. Uh, IgG4 does not bind complement and does not uh, bind to FC receptors, FC gamma receptors, uh, which are two of the targets of the IVIG, and uh, that 
could explain, at least we think that that could explain why these patients do not respond to IVIG and do respond to uh, plasma exchange. So uh, to go further, as I said, tremor is a, a common feature in inflammatory neuropathies. It can al almost affect 50% of patients. But uh, this type of, tre of tremor is not so frequent. And, and in fact, in our series, there, wa there was no other patient with that tremor. Uh, very recently, this, this group published um, a paper saying that the cerebellar learning distinguishes patients with CIDP and other inflammatory neuropathies that have, that, that have or not a tremor. So uh, suggesting that uh, the tremor in these patients, despite uh, uh, historically was um, thought to be of peripheral origin, was in fact of cerebellar origin. That, that is something that, um, that uh, led us to think a little bit more. And uh, in fact, this, this, uh, this group uh, say this phrase that is that one possibility in these patients uh, that have tremor and cerebellar impairment, uh, one possibility is that those with tremor have a specific antibody involved in causing the neuropathy or cross the blood-brain barrier. And they, they go on like this. And so we decided to, to test if that was true. And in fact, as expected to, uh, these patients had uh, not only features that suggested a cerebellar origin, but their antibodies bound to, uh, this is the patient, this is a control, bound to the molecular and the granular layers uh, of the cerebellum while uh, the controls did not. They also bound to other structures in the brain. Uh, and this was true for all four patients, even for that patient that did not have tremor from Santander. And uh, the problem with that patient is that the titers of the antibodies were lower. So we believe that this hypothesis that the, others, the other group uh, prompt of uh, maybe the antibodies crossing the blood-brain barrier, we believe that that, that could be the case that explained why uh, just that patient did not have tremor and all the others had a, a tremor of cerebellar features. And uh, so antibodies, to, to sum up, uh, antibodies, uh, IgG4 anti neurofascin antibodies associated with a homogeneous CIDB phenotype, again, uh, with distal predominance, tremor, IVAG resistance. Uh, the tremor in these in this patients, we believe, has an, a cerebellar origin because the tremor features itself uh, because the antibodies bind to cerebellar structures and because the model of uh, of uh, uh, the animal model of knockout of neurofascin 155 shows not only a, a, a demyelinated, demyelinated neuropathy but also cerebral impairment. And although the overall prevalence of these antibodies is low, the same as contacting one, it's significantly higher, up to 25% of those patients that do not respond to IVIG. So, in conclusion, uh, autoantibodies against uh, node of RMB structures uh, play a role in CIDP development. Uh, the CIDP clinical heterogeneity that I showed in the first slides disappears when, when patients are grouped, uh, defined by autoantibody status and not by clinical and electrophysiological features. Anticontacting 1 and neurofasting uh, 155 antibodies are the first an autoantibodies with diagnostic and prognostic implications in CIDP. And these findings, uh, we believe, will help personalizing CIDP therapy uh, according to the presence or not of these autoantibodies. And um, just uh, a little bit from the f for the future, not only patients have antibodies against hippocampal neurons, but we are starting to see that they also can have antibodies against swan cells and DRG neurons, which obviously uh, will keep us busy. Uh, I would like to thank, first of all, to Isabel, because uh, uh, this is um, uh, thanks to, the, to, to her, and also Gisela Nogales, that, that uh, was uh, a close partner and co-author of, of my paper. So thank you. Questions? Yes, I can. Did you check, I don't know if I missed it, did you check for the specificity of the 
antibodies of the patient, the first ones for contacting one, Casper one, mm -hmm. that could not be affect, or at least under high titers, affect contacting two, Casper two, that are at just a paranormal. Because that would be a nice picture to show that an initial delamination or separation of the paranoid could progress to the next and, and well, so explain the, a little bit. The only, we did it, we, we checked if these patients had, because this was a question for our reviewers in the paper, and we checked if the patients first had, auto, if, if they had autoantibodies against Casper too, because that was uh, described in neuromyotonia and it's not the same disease, but it's also peripheral nerve and, and uh, they don't have autoantibodies against Casper II. The second thing we did was the opposite, to see if a patient with anti-Casper II antibodies and neuromyotonia, the only patient that we have because it's extremely rare, uh, if that patient had antibodies against contacting one or Casper one, and, and that patient did not have uh, antibodies uh, against contacting one or Casper one. So it, it looks like it's very specific. And, and just the second for a curiosity for, for these patients with so strong tremor clinically, uh, did you check for potential abnormalities in the uh, muscle spindles and gamma motoneurons? Uh, we, that we, could be explained a lack of control, peripheral control, not just going to the cerebral. Yeah, uh, these patients uh, for sure will have uh, a peripheral deficit. In fact, they have uh, sensory deficits and, and they have a, an ataxia that also worsens with uh, a little bit with, uh, with eyes closed. But uh, this is something we see in many patients with CIDP and in fact we have a toxic, pure ataxic CIDPs that have a tremor also, but the tremor is, is uh, of a higher frequency and not that uh, amplitude. So of course they could have also a, a peripheral component of the tremor, but we believe that, that this has a prominent, uh, has prominent cerebellar features and that could be uh, the explanation why. There's another question there. No? Okay. Mm. Very beautiful. Huh. So uh, one thing, I, I'm not sure that I, I got it right. So it's uh, regarding the, the uh, phenotype or uh, the symptoms of the patient, the, the one with the, con the contacting antibodies, do they have central symptoms or not? Uh, they don't. The contacting so one... Please comment on that. Yeah. Uh, well, this, this is something that happens all along uh, neuroimmunology, for example, aquaporin for uh, neuro optic neuromyelitis. Uh, Yes. Uh, so uh, acoprin 4 is all over and mostly in uh, kidney, etc. And they don't have kidney problems. So we don't know exactly what's going on and we don't know if the, uh, the blood-brain barrier is not so affected to have uh, central symptoms in these patients or if there's anything else that you need, for example, uh, complement that, that you don't have in the central nervous system. Uh, for this specific type of patients, not for the neurofasting, but uh, the thing is that they don't have symptoms. And that, that also, um, uh, as I say, happens in other diseases. Uh, we don't know why, but it's, it's, it's the case. Okay, good. Yeah, very nice, <clears throat> your paper. But let me ask you two things, because I'm surprised you call that the antibodies are pathogenic. There is any evidence for that? For example, do you see change in the antibody titers with, uh, say, progression of the disease, or there are stable titers that it behaves? Well, um, the... uh, we believe that they are uh, pathogenic. We don't know. We have some experimental evidence that the antibodies disrupt the binding of contacting two neurofasting. So, uh, but this is not published and, and this is very preliminary and, and we didn't want to, to show it uh, specifically. Uh, we don't, so these, these patients are very few, so we cannot make correlations about the clinics. Uh, we could, at least for the neurofasting, those ones, uh, it seems that the, the, severe, the, the more severe the disease, the higher the titer, but uh, 
you cannot do statistics on that because it's just three patients. Uh, what we know also is that uh, when you treat, uh, for example, the patient, the first patient that we got uh, from of neurofasting 155, uh, the titers uh, decrease when you mm, treat the patient and the tra and the patient improves. But you you cannot say if that's a, a, a cause a, re a, a direct cause relationship, but just a, a epiphenomenon uh, that general improvement just drives the antibodies down. And another question, have you checked if there is a T cell response? Sorry? To a T cell response, a proliferation of CD4 or CD8 in response to the, to your antigen, the antigen no. you have identified in those patients? No, we haven't. Okay, thank you. Uh, to get at the pathogenesis, uh, have you, do you, are you aware if anyone's actually tried to immunize mice with an, antigens to these to see yeah. if they develop a neuropathy? Well, we, we have to, this is, uh, in fact, the, this second thing is not published yet, it's, it's under review, so I'm saying uh, a lot of things that are not published, but, uh, so yes, we are collaborating with a, with a group in Marseille that, that are basic uh, scientists that, that have animal models and everything, and we have uh, two plans, first uh, active immunization and second uh, passive transfer. We have uh, plasma from the plasma exchange of these patients. We have liters of plasma of these patients and, uh, and we, we believe that we could uh, sometime demonstrate that those are pathogenic. 